Our next, our next speaker is Dr. Carol Grossman. Uh, I haven't had a chance to meet Carol. Where's, here she comes. Come up and stand next to me, Carol. She's Acting Assistant Secretary of the National Water Policy Branch in the Australian Department of Agriculture and Water Resources and has held this role since late 2018. Prior to that, she was Director of Australia's Water Efficiency okay. Labelling and Standards Wells Program for two and a half years. Now, so under her guidance, the Wells Program has adapted a much stronger compliance stance and established systems to use its legislative powers consistently and transparently. transparently and they've improved communication tools also for industry and strengthened relationships with industry groups, state and territory building and plumbing regulations regulators and the Australian Building Codes Board Office. And that's also led uh, towards an ISO international standard for water efficiency labelling with uh, 13 countries now participating in developing uh, that ISO standard. You can read a little bit more about uh, Carol's background and a full biography in your handbooks. Uh, today she's going to focus on wells. The topic is Australia's Water Efficiency Labelling and Standards Scheme, its benefits and future directions. She will be taking questions, so fire up the, uh, fire up the app and we'll uh, take some questions of her shortly. Please welcome Carol Grossman. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, so let me, sorry, big green button. That wasn't too hard. Um, so essentially, our water efficiency labeling and standard scheme, we call it WELLS. Um, it's a mandatory labeling scheme. So basically, um, water consuming domestic products are required to be uh, tested for water consumption, registered, and then labeled in accordance with an Australian standard before they can be offered for supply. Um, the legislation applies when uh, products are supplied to a retailer, say from a wholesaler, uh, when they're sold in a retail store or an online store or platform, but also when they're sold as part of a new building or a unit or uh, even as part of a modular, uh, modular building component. Now, what I want to do is just give a little bit of context, and a couple of the other speakers have, have mentioned some of these aspects in, in their talks as well. Um, essentially, Australia does have you know, a, a, a lot of trouble with, with um, consistency of water availability. So we've got a very highly variable rainfall, and we suffer from frequent droughts. And the slide that I've got up there now shows the rainfall for the last two years. Um, the red and dark red are in the sort of lowest 1%, 10%, and sometimes lowest on record uh, rainfalls. And the areas that are affected by that are where our major cities are. So along the east coast and, and the southeast corner where we are now, um, the southwest corner where Perth is, and so forth, are all affected. And it's quite common for them to be affected at the same time. And in fact, I just changed this slide in the past when I've given this talk. I've used a slide from the millennium drought taken from 2007 in the, in the peak of that drought. And it was really striking as I put these two pictures up how similar they are and in fact probably slightly, uh, slightly more red in this one than, than in the millennium drought. So we're definitely um, facing some challenges at the moment. Now again, I've, I've got a few slides going through some of the context in Australia and this shows the water supply sources for our major cities, our capital cities. Um, the SEQ on the, the right, that stands for Southeast Queensland, so that captures both Brisbane and the Gold Coast, which are part of one interconnected supply system. And the blue is, is surface water. Uh, there's a category called interregion inflow, but that's essentially surface water just coming in from a different, uh, different part than, than uh, just where that city is. Um, one of the things you can see is green is desalinated water. And you can see that Perth is now using about half desalination water about half groundwater, and they've pretty much given up relying on surface water because they're just not getting the inflows. Um, you can also see Adelaide has used desalination water. Melbourne has started. Uh, Sydney, you can't see it yet, but Sydney started up its desalination um, uh, plant in the last year, and they're now looking at steps that they can take to double its capacity to, uh, to try and deal with demand. Now, one of the key things is that desalination water is expensive. It uses a lot of equipment, it uses a lot of, of energy. So it's there, but it's not necessarily the, uh, the easiest solution or the, certainly not the cheapest solution. And one last slide to, to look at this. This is water storage uh, as of um, a couple days ago. 
in the capital cities across the country. Um, Sydney's now down below 50%. So 60% was the point where it triggered turning on their desalination plant. They're now at a point where they're starting the process to double its capacity. Um, Perth at 46% looks bad, but in fact, um, because Perth isn't relying on its surface water, it doesn't matter as much to their water security. Melbourne down to 58% and finding that, uh, as, as um, I think Steve mentioned, demand is also increasing, so that doesn't last as long as what they'd initially thought it would. Part of the demand increase is population growth, but part of it is that when the temperatures are warmer, people use more water. So um, it's, I was at a meeting down in Melbourne um, Friday um, with the states and territories, and it was focused on urban water and urban water security. And we heard, for example, from New South Wales that if the drought continues as it's going, um, Sydney might be close to running out of water in two years. So that would be if there were no inflows, but it's definitely um, something that galvanizes people. And as one of the previous speakers also mentioned, regional communities in some cases are facing running out of water. So up around the New South Wales-Queensland border, towns like Stanthorpe and Tenterfield are quite close. It is a state responsibility to respond to that, and states have systems in place, or local governments do, to bring in water and ensure that people still have uh, water to use. But it's definitely not easy for people. And as has been mentioned, this is not, this is not a uniquely Australian problem. Um, a lot of people live in places with, um, with high water stress, and, and uh, groundwater supplies are being tapped into in a way that's not necessarily sustainable. So witness Jakarta looking at finding a new location for the capital because, in large part because of subsidence, because they've been taking out groundwater um, at an unsustainable rate. Um, having said that, Australia is uh, better equipped to plan and manage for the water security challenges than many of the other countries. So having given that context, we'll return back to our wells program. In Australia, water management is the responsibility of states and territories. The, the national government provides oversight, guidance, um, leadership in different areas. Now, in 2004, in the millennium drought, um, states and territories and the Australian government all agreed on what's called the National Water Initiative. So it's an intergovernmental agreement setting out principles um, and arrangements for managing water. So that set the, the scene for things like the Murray-Darling Basin Plan, but also um, set out an agreement to establish the Wells Act. So because it's not a Commonwealth role, it needed the states and territories to all agree to, uh, to work together on that. And they agreed that the Commonwealth would manage um, this program. So within a year, we had the Water Efficiency Labeling and Standards Act up and running. Um, the object of the act, threefold, it's really about conserving water by reducing consumption, providing information for people who are buying water using and water saving products, and promoting adoption of um, water saving technologies. So you can think about if, if those of you who can remember back in the Millennium Drought, if you were going to go and buy a washing machine, you knew that it was going to be important to buy a washing machine that wouldn't use that much water, but how could you tell? So this gave people a way to, um, to distinguish and tell and know that they were buying something efficient. So I've got a few slides going through the, the scheme benefits and whether it works in meeting those ob objectives. Um, first one was about informing consumers. We haven't revisited this, this um, research, but in uh, 2014, we had some market research undertaken. 87% of consumers recognized the Wells label. That's the kind of brand recognition that most companies would give a lot for. Um, most people did use the star ratings to compare water efficiency of products, and they were influenced by that in deciding what to buy. So it, it definitely does influence consumer behavior in Australia. Uh, we've also had some work done by the University of Technology, Sydney, uh, looking at the effectiveness in, in uh, reducing water consumption. And you can see the top row of that shows the savings in gigaliters per year. So a gigaliter is a billion liters. Um, essentially, one gigaliter will fill about 400 Olympic, Olympic swimming pools. So when you start trying to picture that, that's a lot of water. So uh, I think 2017 was about 112 gigaliters a year. Now we're up to around 120 and looking at well over 200 by uh, 2036. So big savings there. Um, we also found, and, and like our previous speaker said, you know, we had been looking at water savings, but there's significant energy savings to be had when you start reducing water consumption. And a lot of that's from heating water. But the middle row shows 
the cumulative reduction in greenhouse gas emissions since the scheme started that can be attributed to, to wells. And those are quite significant. But also household utility bill savings. And this is one of the reasons. So consumers use the label because they want to save water, because all Australians know that it's an important thing to do, but also because they can save money by buying more efficient products. And you can see that that's over a billion dollars now and, and rising to uh, well over over two and a half billion by 2036. So, so big savings for people in that space. And that doesn't take into account the savings if water utilities can delay augmenting supply, then there's a savings in terms of utility bills in, in that respect that we don't, we don't see here. This is just the direct savings from people's pocketbooks. So looking at savings by product type, there's a few things you can see on this graph. And one is that the savings start out low as the scheme started. And as the schemes ramped up, the savings increase over time. And that's because the product mix changes over time. And there's an important part here because I want to highlight that the products and systems that get installed now will have a big effect on water consumption for many years to come. So it's part of a transition that we want to, to maintain. Now you can also see that taps and showers down on the bottom in blue have the, provided the greatest savings. Uh, clothes washing machines are next, and then dishwashers. Toilets are a little sliver at the top, which would make you think they don't matter, but in fact, um, efficient toilets are extremely important. It's just that they were already mandated through other means. So the savings aren't attributed to wells and don't, don't show up in here, but they are um, exceptionally important. And the third objective of our, of our legislation was um, about encouraging uptake of water saving technologies. And um, within that, we think it, it has helped in terms of, for one, it's shifted the overall product mix but we've also, um, a couple years ago, changed our standard to recognize and provide for higher st star ratings for the sort of best of, of types. So things like six star toilets, like vacuum toilets, which are now installed in uh, Perth's stadium, um, four star showers that we previously didn't provide a label for because people, consumers weren't always happy with the performance. But now we allow four star showers because we have some comfort testing that, that they can undertake to ensure they still meet consumer expectations. And then clear shifts over time towards efficient clothes washing machines. So front loaders have become a much bigger player in the market. They use a lot less water. So there's been that kind of, kind of shifts happening um, through time. Now I've got a few um, aspects of our future directions that we'd like to, to look at and think about that I'll go through. So one is... Um, that we're now working on an international standard for water efficiency labeling through ISO. Um, Standards Australia has the secretariat for that work, and uh, it's already had a couple of meetings and, and a number of uh, teleconferences. Uh, next meeting is in another month or so in Singapore. So Steve Cummings is the chair of the product committee, uh, the um, ISO committee that's tasked with developing the standards. Uh, Pete DeMarco, who you'll hear from later in this conference, uh, from the U.S. chairs one of the ad hoc working groups, the one that's responsible for plumbing products. Um, expected to take a couple more years to develop, but once that's finalized, we'll need to look at our own standard and see where we can make sure that they, uh, they harmonize and align. And we're hoping that that international standard uh, will be able to decrease compliance costs for Australian businesses because there'll be a little bit more compatibility in, in how those are done. But also, and quite importantly, uh, we've benefited quite a lot from our wells program. And so we thought that having an international standard would make it a lot easier for new countries to come on and implement their own water efficiency labeling schemes and uh, experience some of the water savings. Now we're also uh, working further on some aspects of compliance. We've looked, we're doing quite a lot of, we've done quite a lot of work in the past on making sure that products that are sold in, in retail outlets and online meet our requirements. But we're trying to look more at what's installed in new buildings. Um, that's one of the places where people who are on the ground in the plumbing industry can actually help. Um, they can do that by checking the well's information and making sure it's there on the products, um, but also saving the packaging label. So where the products, they should come with a label, so they're all required to have labels on, on it, um, making sure the consumer actually gets that label. So if a consumer has, say, purchased a unit off a plan and they've been told that they're going to get 
four-star showers and six-star taps, if that's in their information that they get at the end, then they can double-check that themselves as well. You can also refer um, any dodgy products to our Wells compliance staff. Uh, David Jonganil is sitting in the back corner. You want to wave, David? He's the head of our compliance area. Um, so we've got a, uh, an email and also a phone number you can call. And allegations remain confidential. It is one of the ways we find out about some of the more serious non-compliance that's happening. So really appreciate it if you do pass those on. And the other thing you can do is make sure that if you're in the business of supplying products, you only supply products that are registered and labeled um, in accordance with our act. So one other uh, aspect of future directions is that our scheme is set up to have a uh, review by an independent reviewer every five years. So that's part of our legislation. Um, 2015 review found that the scheme was very effective in meeting its requirements and also suggested some ways that we could improve. Uh, we're now starting the planning for the 2020 review and we'll task the reviewer with looking at ways that we could improve the scheme to increase water savings, increase consumer savings, reduce costs of, of uh, compliance for business and, and uh, also for the community. Um, the reviewer will do some consultation, so if people have things they'd like to raise, it'll be a really good um, opportunity for people to, to feed suggestions in. Um, there's also um, the possibility of expanding, so we could consider additional products, but we could also start looking at that sort of system design. So for example, right now we look at those products and what goes in, but, but uh, Steve talked about you know, smart control systems and the ways that you can save water through those, and we don't have any way of recognizing those at the moment. And I've put up an example in my slide of uh, WaterSense, the, the US program, um, labels products, but also homes. So it's a way of encouraging better, better design. Um, so those are some of the things that we'll be looking at. Um, there's also some things outside of the, the realm of wells specifically. Um, so the government is committed to look to reviewing that 2004 National Water Initiative. And one of the things um, that the Productivity Commission said about it when they last reviewed it in 2017 was that it could do with a stronger focus on urban water management. So in the 2004 agreement, it was sort of on the sides, and, and uh, we want to bring that a little bit more front and center. Now, it's not about taking over. States need to implement these things the best way that suits their, their local um, requirements. But it's about, again, setting up principles and, and guidance. And one of the things that's been identified through a number of different channels is that we do our urban planning, and we often do water as a secondary component to that. So cities, you know, new greenfields developments get planned, and then the question is how much water do you need in your supply? And there's no integration of how you plan for water supply and wastewater management with stormwater. So bringing that in um, so that we can manage stormwater in a way that's coordinated with the rest of the water management allows us to use that stormwater to either provide water or to be irrigating public open space through things like stormwater or reuse of wastewater rather than through potable water supply. Um, those sorts of things can be done through centralized or decentralized approaches. So you can do it for a particular development, but you can also do it at a, at a larger um, water supply and catchment scale. So that's one of the, the, the broader aspects. So I just want to end with just pointing out that when we look at the future, it's, you know, if everybody in this room can be really aware that what you do now will affect water security, and the cost of supply for years to come. So you've really got the opportunity to have an impact on the water efficiency of a lot of households. So a lot of people in Australia are concerned about saving water, and they do their own part within their own homes. But you can have a broader impact in keeping in mind that what we do now has that long-term effect because you know the products you choose, the way they're installed, um, the, the design of the systems, all are important. So I'd encourage you to consider water efficiency when you're in, in whatever aspect of the industry you're involved in. Be open to innovative approaches that might provide a more efficient solution. Use our Wells program to choose and recommend efficient products. And when you do find non-compliance, please refer it to our compliance team. So thank you. And I, uh, I think I didn't leave quite as much time as I'd hoped oh, for. Okay. We'll, we'll get some questions. Okay, uh, Carol, we've got a, a couple of questions. Uh, interesting one here. How popular are vacuum toilets in Australia and how do you see this growing in the future? 
Look, in a way, that's a question that's probably better fit for the, suited to the industry. But I, I think vacuum toilets are kind of a separate niche. You, you can't really just go and add one to your home. So when you're doing a renovation, you're not going to put in a, a, a vacuum toilet. So it's got to be considered in that whole design. Um, so I suppose it's like that first, the future, futurist talk we heard this morning. It's part of the future, possibly, but it depends on what's adopted, and uh, I can't predict that. Another one is, when can you see a world standard, including EU and USA, or are there too many regional variants? Look, we're hoping that the ISO standard will provide that sort of overarching guidance, but it's quite clear that there's still going to be a need for individual regional variations. We're not going to all change. The way that we test our products is linked into how we test our products for... for um, uh, you know, fit for purpose and so forth, and that depends a lot on other systems. So I don't think we can get to that stage. And also the label itself is about nudging consumer behavior, and that's going to be different depending on cultural norms and expectations. So we'll try and get a little bit more cohesive, but the chances of one system are, you know, it's probably unlikely. Okay. And one more, this is an interesting one too. Uh, when will there be a well system for reclaimed, recycled, or fit for purpose water products? Well, that's a great question and, and probably fits in with what I've said, you know, my, my last yeah, couple good. slides. Um, I, I can't answer it per se, but it's something that could come up in our 2020 review and be part of that looking at holistic solutions. If it doesn't come up through wells, it'll certainly be part of that NWI renewal consideration and process. Very good. Please thank Carol for her presentation. Thanks, Carol. Thanks.